It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Good morning, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. There's no question, though, that Ontario's health care system is in crisis. But make no mistake, this crisis is by design. This government has underfunded our hospitals, held down the wages of our health care workers, and now, after years and years of neglect, the government has tabled a new bill that uses this crisis as an excuse to expand for-profit health care in Ontario. Hospitals and long-term care homes are already desperately fighting to retain nurses and doctors in what is really a staffing crisis across the system, and they're now going to face competition from new two-tier investor-driven clinics. Nothing in this bill prevents that from happening. Can the Premier guarantee today that these for-profit clinics will not poach staff from our publicly funded hospitals and long-term care homes? Well, thank you for the question. Thank you uh, for the question from the Leader of the Opposition as well. I'll tell you, when we took office in 2018, the health care system was an absolute disaster. There was hallway health care. It was just a total, total mess. Since 2018, we've hired 60,000, I repeat, 60,000 new nurses, 8,000 new doctors. We put a medical school together that's going to graduate more doctors. Order. Just last year alone, Mr. Speaker, we hired over 12,000 nurses that came on board. We've spent $14 billion more, a record in Canada, when it came to health care. We're building 50 new sites across every single region, community, and city, spending over $40 billion, Response. making sure they have the infrastructure they need. I'll finish on question number two there. Thank you. Order. The supplementary question. I, I, I guess that's a no, Speaker. That's a no, because no matter what this government says anyways, they can't guarantee that. They can't guarantee that, because they're too busy fighting in court to keep those workers' wages down in the public system. Meanwhile, we have operating rooms collecting dust in our hospitals and shifts that are unfilled. I want to go back to the Premier again. This bill also includes no actual oversight mechanism to ensure patient safety. The Minister of Health yesterday couldn't even say which body would be overseeing these clinics to ensure that procedures are done safely. Couldn't say that. What concrete guarantees can the Premier make today regarding people's safety in these for-profit clinics? Premier. Speaker, as we're building the health care system, the opposition is blocking it every step of the way. They have no solution, Mr. Speaker, for the 203,000 backlog surgeries. We have a solution. Working collaboratively with the Ontario Hospital Association, working collaboratively with the Ontario Medical Association, working collaboratively with the CEOs of the hospitals to make sure we take the burden off the hospitals when it comes to a hip replacement, a knee replacement, or cataracts that are happening right now. We are going to expand it. Just think, you have an elderly mother, an elderly father that's been in pain for a year because they can't get a hip replacement, they're going to be able to get that hip replacement and change their lives every single day. When it comes to the nurses, there's 30,000 nurses studying in colleges Response. and universities that are going to join the Ontario health care team. We will continue building health care to make sure we have the best health care system in the entire world, Mr. Speaker. The final supplementary. I'll tell you, Speaker, this government took us from hallway medicine to no medicine, right? right? Operating rooms are empty. Order. ERs are closed because of this staffing crisis. And the fact is, Speaker, the government is asking Ontarians to just trust them. But the minister said yesterday that they wouldn't be able to share some details because of the, and I want to quote her, business model nature of these new clinics. The minister says there are guardrails, but beyond saying people can't, can complain to the ombudsman, the bill doesn't guarantee oversight for public funds or public safety. So again, how will this government ensure that the interest of patients takes precedence over people who just want to make a buck? 
Deputy Premier and Minister of Health to reply. Thank you, Speaker. You know, the member opposite will continue to protect a small group of individuals who don't want to change, who don't sure. want to see change. What we are protecting, what we are advocating for, are patients. Patients who are waiting far too long for cataract surgery, for knee surgery, for hip replacement. We want those individuals to be able to be back with their families, back in their communities, back in their jobs. We're doing that by making the investments that we have with your Health Care Ontario Act. I am very, very proud of the work that our stakeholders have done. Clinicians, hospital leaders, individuals who are working in the system who understand that innovation is not a bad word. We're making those investments. We've ensured through our investments, like the medical school in the city of Brampton, that we'll have new, new students starting next September, able to be able to have those opportunities here in Ontario in our publicly funded system. Thank you. The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, this government has shown over and over again that their interest is in a few people getting very rich, not in Ontarians and their suffering. There is, there is, a, cloud, there is a cloud hanging over this government, and I want to go back to the Premier. Yesterday, the Premier Order. dodged questions about the curious nature of his cosy relationships with developers. We know that developers just happened to receive some oddly specific ministerial zoning orders and access to protected greenbelt land just months after attending a fundraiser for the Premier's family. So, in the interest of transparency, I'm going to ask again. Did anyone in the Premier's office, past or present, or any other government staff, have a role in making the invitation list for his family's fundraiser? To respond, the government house leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I think uh, the Premier's answered that on a number of occasions, and uh, equally importantly, the Commissioner, uh, Integrity Commissioner, has also uh, reviewed, uh, reviewed that. But, Mr. Speaker, what this is obviously about is the inability, inability of the opposition to see what is happening in the province of Ontario, the progress, the prosperity that is happening across our province. We want to build new homes for people. We want the people who are coming. Order. Over 300,000 people who are coming to Ontario each and every year to fill the thousands of jobs that are available because of the incredible investments that have been made by this minister, by this premier, to bring jobs back to Ontario. And you know what they want? They want what everybody wants, Mr. Speaker, what my parents wanted, what everybody wants when they come to this country. They want to have the ability to buy their first home. They want to have a Order. community to live in that is prosperous. They want to be able to, to raise a family, have good schools, safe streets. Mr. Speaker, that is what we're doing, building a stronger, more prosperous, safer Ontario, and they'll do everything in their power to avoid that to happen. Yeah. Stop the clock. Order. Well, while the clock is stopped, I'll remind the members that we have the Youth Parliament participants in the visitors gallery today and I think we want to show them our best efforts today. Start the clock. Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, you know, I, I really think that the people of this province deserve answers from the Premier. Uh, there is a smell around this issue and a, and a, and a, and a, and a cloud over this government. Um, it goes without saying that when you're the premier of a province, you are held to a higher standard than the average father of the bride, okay? Especially when the guest list includes lobbyists and developers who have since received suspiciously favorable changes to the law. The premier has said his family events have an open door policy. Why then are there reports that some people felt they were being strong-armed into paying to attend? Again, to the Premier, did anyone from his office help create the invitation list for this event, yes or no? Good question. Well, well, Mr. Speaker, I think that uh, question and, uh, and the way the Leader of the Opposition uh, has been uh, uh, asking over the last few days is indicative of where the NDP really is at. Right? Order. It's not about the economy. It's not about building better schools. It's not about building long-term care. It's not about changing health care to make it better for the people of the province of Ontario. Forget about the changes that the Minister of uh, Energy has done to ensure that people can afford to pay their bills, Mr. Speaker. Forget about safe streets. Forget about the students who are going to college. 
colleges and universities. The only thing that the NDP care about is bringing down the people of the province of Ontario. And what are we doing? We're building back this province stronger than it was before, Mr. Speaker. We're cutting taxes for people. We're building roads. We're building highways. We're building transit systems. We're building 60 thousand new long-term care beds across the province of Ontario. Our Minister of Agriculture Spons. is doing everything that she can to make one of the most important industries in our province prosperous, despite punishing carbon taxes from a federal government, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to get the job done, despite the Leader of the Opposition. Member for Ottawa Centre to come to order. The final supplementary. This is about, this is about having a government that Ontarians can trust a responsible government, a government that Ontarians could be proud of. That's what this is about. And these are the questions that Ontarians have, and this Premier won't answer them. Let's review the timeline, shall we? The stag and doe was in August, the wedding in September. Just two months later, this government broke Order. its promise to the people of Ontario and started carving up the Greenbelt. Now we find out that some of the very people who attended the Premier's family festivities suddenly had their land value skyrocket due to this government's decisions. Curious. But the Premier or the government House leader even can clear this up right now. Did the Premier share his intentions to open up the Greenbelt with developer guests Question. who contributed to this family fundraiser? Commissioner Conestoga will come to order. The government House leader to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, the Integrity Commissioner has reviewed this, and I think uh, uh, what he has said is, is obviously very important, Mr. Speaker. Order. But look, the people of the province of Ontario made a very important decision in June, Mr. Speaker, and what they decided to do was reduce the opposition and to elect more progressive Conservatives to this chamber to get their priorities done, Mr. Speaker. They had had enough of the negativity that they were coming from the, from the opposition. Now, Mr. Speaker, this is a party who couldn't even muster enough energy up to have a leadership race. They had to appoint their leader, Mr. Speaker, a party that has been so diminished Order. by the people of the province of Ontario that their newly elected, selected leader won't even sit in the seat of the opposition leader they want to sit over, Mr. Speaker. But that's, that's not important. What is important is building better for the people of the province of Ontario, building more homes so that the next Order. generation can have every bit of optimism Spons. that they can afford to have a home, that people can have jobs and opportunity like millions of other Ontarians have had, and the people of Ontario know that only this side and the members of the Conservative Caucus on that side will get it. Stop the clock. The House will come to order. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Two weeks ago, Waterloo councillors voted to defer a $68 million reconstruction project that would have created 800 new homes. Why? Because they're not getting answers from the government about how to fund the needed infrastructure to support the new housing. Council's decision came after city staff found that Bill 23 is estimated to cost the city between $23 and $31 million over the next few years. They paused work on development charges study to allow for more time to fully understand the financial implications of this bill. Meanwhile, the housing crisis continues to get worse in Waterloo and Ontario. Bill 23 is already having a cooling effect on new housing starts. Will the minister go back to the drawing board and truly consult with municipalities to actually incentivize new housing in the province of Ontario? The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, Speaker. Um, yeah, we're very concerned with some of the uh, things we're hearing from uh, the Mayor and Council in Waterloo. Uh, obviously, we've had a, a very good dialogue recently with the big city mayors. I attended their, their last meeting, uh, and I look forward to the continuing the conversation around development charges as we develop uh, the rules around um, those DC incentives. We do not believe uh, on the, uh, as a government that uh, nonprofits and affordable housing providers should be charged huge unsustainable fees from municipalities. We believe the best way to incentivize those costs is to directly eliminate 
uh, or reduced development charges. That's the policy of the government. We look forward to working with our municipal partners, but we're very concerned with some of the things that are being discussed around Waterloo Regional Council. The supplementary. Well, this minister created the problem, so we're also very concerned with Bill 23. And it's not just home construction that is now being delayed, it's actually vital infrastructure like pumping stations, roads, storm sewers, water mains. This is infrastructure that would help drive new housing projects across Waterloo and Ontario. The government promised to make municipalities, I quote, whole financially, but Waterloo Councillor Freeman said Council doesn't see the tools to actually secure the development charges to pay for that growth. Construction on this project won't move ahead now until 2024 because of the financial uncertainty that this government has caused with Bill 23. When will the government repeal Bill 23, which is jeopardizing the progress of Waterloo and other cities across Ontario by eliminating those development fees that municipalities rely on to help pay for the necessary infrastructure. Go back to the drawing board. Let's get it right. The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, we want municipal partners to work with us, and, and I want to applaud, uh, for example, the City of London. Uh, who just recently passed a motion approving the housing pledge that we've asked all the big city mayors. But I want to speak the difference between what we're hearing by New Democrats and the government. I want to speak specifically to the young people that are in our audience today. Unsustainable fees like we see in the GTA are adding $116,900 to the average cost of home. What, it, what it means to you is it means another $800 a month on a mortgage over 20 years. What are we seeing? We're seeing millennials having to save 20 years to be able to put a down payment on a home. Unacceptable. That's unacceptable by our government. We want all three levels of government to be working together. Municipalities, we've heard from many municipalities who want to work Response. with us. Again, very concerned with what I'm hearing from Waterloo. Folks, I want you to know something. We hear you. We want you to realize the dream of home ownership. I need to remind all members to please make their comments through the chair, not directly to the public galleries. Restart the clock. The next question, the member for Barry Innisfil. Skills trades are a vital part of our province's economy, but unfortunately, after 15 years of neglect under the previous NDP-supported Liberal government, we are experiencing critical labour shortages in this sector. In Barrie Innisfil, thousands of jobs are being unfilled in the trades sector. These jobs represent opportunities for people, many of them good-paying good paychecks with benefits and potential pensions. These are jobs that are valued. They're important and they're urgently needed for our province to overcome the housing shortage we are facing and to rebuild vital infrastructure. Can the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development tell us what our government is doing to address the skill shortage that is currently holding back Ontario from its economic potential? Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Barrie Innisfil, who does a great job advocating for the skilled trades in her region of the province. Uh, Mr. Speaker, from day one, our government has known the skilled trades needed more attention and investments. I'm pleased to share with all members the success of our first-ever skilled trades career fairs for students. Over the course of 10 days, more than 13,000 students in five regions had the opportunity to try the skilled trades and learn firsthand about the trades from over 90 exhibitors, including uh, unions, employers, and colleges. Later this year, we'll be bringing these fairs back and expanding them to even more locations right across the province. Speaker, by giving more students a chance to see for themselves how rewarding and exciting the trades are, we're setting them up for success. And as Premier Ford always says, when you have a career in the skilled trades, you have a career for life. The supplementary question. 
Thank you, Speaker. Our government understands we're going to need skills trades to build up more housing. We're going to need skills trades to build up our transportation system, whether it's the subway or the GO Transit, critical hospital infrastructure. All this is needed. We need to get more men and women trained in these great, rewarding careers in the skills trades. And together, we can build a better, prosperous province that is operating in all cylinders. Speaker, can the minister tell our, our government and tell this House what we're doing to make it easier to remove the barriers to entry when it comes to pursuing careers in the skills trades? Minister of Labour. Thank you again to the member for this uh, really important question. And Mr. Speaker, since we first formed government, we have increased the number of immigrants we were nominating for permanent residency by 50%. Last year, I'm pleased to share that a record 40 per cent of those we nominated were in the skilled trades. For example, in 2018, we nominated 219 construction workers. In 2022, we nominated 835 construction workers. Furthermore, we also passed legislation that eliminates the requirement for Canadian work experience to work in the skilled trades here in Ontario. We're welcoming the skilled immigrants we need and breaking down the barriers that newcomers face when arriving here in Ontario. Speaker, we need all hands on deck to build back a stronger province and a stronger country. Thank you. The next question, the member for Nickel Belt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question pour la Belta. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question for the Minister of Health. Yesterday, the Minister took a huge step toward the destruction of Medicare. The Auditor General, Doctors for Medicare, the Ontario Health Coalition, Health Quality Ontario, Canadian Medical Association and Ontarians are all saying the same thing, Speaker. The Minister's bill will allow corporations to make big profits off the back of sick people. Yet, there is no oversight to protect patients in her bill. Why not? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, yesterday we made another investment to ensure that publicly funded health care, a system that in Ontario people believe in and want to be there appropriately in their communities, is going to be for generations to come. You know, our government, as the Premier mentioned, um, since 2018, $14 billion new investment in health care in Ontario. What has that investment given us, Speaker? It's given us two new medical schools in the works. It has given us an opportunity to actually ensure that people who are practicing medicine in other parts of Canada can do that the next day when they come to Ontario. We have, through your Health Act, ensured for generations to come that a growing population, that an aging population will be protected under a publicly funded health care system. I am incredibly proud of the work that our stakeholders, our clinicians, our Bots. hospitals, our physicians have done and are supporting your health care act today. Supplementary question. Speaker, there has been years of research on private for-profit investor-owned corporation delivering publicly funded health care services. The results are clear. Longer wait times, no incentive for quality care, it is not efficient, and it is associated with increased mortality. Why is the minister destroying Medicare? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, by boosting the number of publicly funded clinics in community, we are actually ensuring that the patients get access to the medically necessary services that they deserve and expect in a timely way. The member opposite is willing to have people languish on wait lists. Our government is not. We have funded three additional expansions to Cataract in Windsor, in Kitchener-Waterloo, in Ottawa. We've done that, and those uh, clinically funded programs are already in place and already serving more patients in the province of Ontario. We'll continue to make those expansions because I do not believe at my core that it is appropriate to have people waiting for medically necessary procedures in their community. It is unfathomable to me that the member Order. opposite doesn't understand by expanding what is already in place in the province of Ontario with over 800 community come to order. clinics that we do not Spons. see an opportunity here to serve the patient better. Thank you, Speaker. Next question, the member for Chatham-Kent-Leamington. 
Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Indigenous Affairs and Northern Development. Because of the policies of the previous Liberal government, supported strongly by the NDP, jobs were driven out of our province, holding back our full economic potential. Ontario's northern, remote, and Indigenous communities experienced these losses and setbacks most severely. That is why it's vital that our government partner with and promote economic development in Indigenous communities to create more opportunities for businesses and jobs throughout the province. Supporting Indigenous economic development furthers reconciliation. It creates opportunities to strengthen relationships with Indigenous partners. Speaker, can the minister please inform the legislature on how our government plans to increase economic prosperity for Indigenous communities in Ontario? Here, here. Thank you. The Minister of Indigenous Affairs. I want to thank the member opposite for the extraordinary work he does on behalf of his constituents in southwestern Ontario. Mr. Speaker, I'm so proud to serve with a, a Premier and a caucus that's put a particular emphasis and a top priority on economic development and prosperity for Indigenous communities across this province, Mr. Speaker. Let the record reflect that re now National Chief Roseanne Archibald's idea to develop a wealth and uh, prosperity uh, table with Indigenous business leaders and uh, political leaders across the province, and Regional Chief Hare's uh, suggestion that, that that manifest itself in a fund, Mr. Speaker, to uh, ensure that Indigenous businesses have a place in the supply chains in every sector of economic opportunity in this province, Mr. Speaker. They're manifesting themselves. We're pleased to work with them as full partners, Mr. Speaker, and our own ministry has come up Response. with two exciting programs to ensure that Indigenous communities and businesses play an integral role in Ontario's economic prosperity. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. Businesses are only part of a vibrant economy, and there are additional ways to amplify prosperity and build up all of Ontario. Indigenous communities and organizations are providing leadership in developing infrastructure and growth plans that build businesses and create employment opportunities. Investments with First Nations partners will ensure long-term economic growth for Indigenous communities and for all of Ontario. Let's continue investing in Indigenous communities and creating more opportunities for everyone. Speaker, can the minister please explain to the legislature what our government is doing today to support prosperity in Indigenous communities? Great. Minister of Indigenous Affairs. There sure are ways, uh, Mr. Speaker. Our ministry's own funds, and now applications are open, Mr. Speaker, uh, through the uh, Indigenous Economic Development Fund, Mr. Speaker. Three important tranches the Economic Diversification Grant, the Business and Community Fund, and the Regional Partnership Grants. These focus on training opportunities, Mr. Speaker, that are pertinent and specific to economic opportunities close ha at hand to Indigenous communities, Mr. Speaker. We have the Indigenous Community Capital Grants Program. I like to call it the Bricks and Mortar Program. We heard loud and clear in Greenstone just a week or two ago that the Kenogamesis Development Corporation's got a lot of opportunities there for growth in that region, Mr. Speaker, but they need a, bil a building to operate and to be fully integrated, not just on reserve, Mr. Speaker, off reserve, where all of the action is taking place in and around their communities. Mr. Speaker, full partnerships with Indigenous Response. communities and their economic development corporations is what this government's priorities are moving forward so we can ensure in in Indigenous businesses and communities are fully integrated into economic prosperity for this great province. The next question, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. While the government is proceeding with its for-profit surgery plan, there are operatings in Toronto that are sitting empty. SickKids Hospital is not able to open two of their operating rooms because of staffing shortages at a time when 3,400 children are waiting for necessary surgery. Minister, why are you proceeding with for-profit surgery delivery when we have operating rooms sitting idle in public hospitals? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, there is no doubt that we want to make sure that our uh, most challenged 
and uh, youngest patients have health care where they need it, when they need it. And I will never, ever talk down sick kids. You know, they are a world-renowned hospital that has been providing exceptional care, including, I might su suggest, when we saw a surge in RSV. And in fact, it was actually sick kids, sick kids clinicians, nurses, doctors who stepped up and assisted community hospitals to make sure that they had the same level of knowledge and appreciation of how to deal with children coming into their emergency departments with RSV. You know, when, when we saw those surges in our sick kids hospitals across Ontario, we made immediate investments that have now turned into permanent investments, including pediatric ICU. So the, the hospitals themselves, the clinicians, Response. the staff have stepped up, and we as a government will continue to support their work to make sure that our most vulnerable are protected. Supplementary question. Minister, there was nothing in that answer that indicated how you are looking at increasing capacity in public hospitals. That's right. I want to go back to the Minister of Health. This isn't just an issue with sick kids. The University Health Network told me their ability to meet overwhelming surgery demand is not because of a lack of operating rooms. It's due to a staffing shortage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. UHN is yeah. cancelling scheduled surgeries because they don't have the staff. Mm -hmm. And allowing for-profit surgeries is not going to alleviate the staffing shortage. It's just not. Minister, my question to you is this. What is your plan to solve the staffing crisis in public hospitals in order to increase operating room capacity in public hospitals? Mr. Health. I will tell you what our government already has done, and that is encouraging and offering a $30 million post-pandemic surgery recovery plan that actually allowed uh, publicly funded hospitals that had capacity to be able to expand their OR hour operating hours. The many, many hospitals have stepped up and done that, specifically related to our pediatric population, which all of us understand is a critically concerning uh, area. As I said, in the fall, when we saw the RSV hitting our pediatric hospitals, and particularly, most dramatically, we did a number of things, including making additional investments in ICU beds that have now become permanent. We have more pediatric ICU bed speaker in the province of Ontario today Order. than we did as recently as six months ago. We will continue Bonds. to make those investments. Premier Ford had made it clear we will not leave our hospital partners behind. Next question, the member for Don Valley East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Yesterday, this government presented a plan for health care that inspired zero confidence that it would protect patients or ensure fair, equitable, timely access in our province. It avoided the root causes of our crisis and made a series of promises that we have no reason to believe will be acted upon. I mean, why should we? This government promised they wouldn't touch the green belt, and then they carved it up. They promised they would sign up 8,000 children to the Ontario Autism Program this year, and Order. instead they just let the waitlist balloon and stopped reporting data. They told us there wasn't a crisis in health care, even as at least 158 emergency departments closed across our province. And now, and now the government is presenting a superficial plan for health care that makes vague promises about guardrails for some of the very same problems they have been consistently ignoring since they came into power. Question. Mr. Speaker, why should anyone trust anything this Premier and government has to say? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. The short answer, Speaker, is the investments are made, being made, the announcements are being made, and we're seeing the uh, results of those investments. You know, when we, in August, directed the College of Nurses of Ontario to expedite, process, and, when appropriate, license internationally educated nurses, we had a historic number of nurses being licensed in the province of Ontario—6,000 nurses that, in 2022, now have the ability to work in their communities in health care and hospitals across Ontario. We've made those investments by announcing not one but two medical facilities, medical universities that are going to train more physicians because we understand that those investments need to be happening. Now, 
Would I have liked to have seen those investments happen 10 years ago? Absolutely. But we're getting Response. it done now. We're fixing a system that, frankly, was ignored for far too long under previous governments. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, I'm glad that the Minister of Health touched on nurses because in August of this year, she promised she would look at the massive problem of temporary for-profit nursing agencies in our province. Well, we're still waiting. We have already seen the poisonous effects of profits in long-term care in which seniors died in droves, and this government did nothing except introduce legislation to protect the most negligent operators and then award them more contracts. And now this government is enabling for-profit operators to siphon health care workers out of our public health care system. As Bill 124 pushes them out, temporary nursing agencies are pulling them out. Many of these agencies engage in unscrupulous recruiting practices, like hiring out of parking lots, or they institute harmful contractual obligations that stop nurses from working in the location of their choice. Others engage in rampant price gouging, allowing hospitals to be charged three or four times the normal rates. Will this government Question. explain why they have not fulfilled their promise to take action on temporary for-profit nursing agencies? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, I'm sure the member opposite appreciates and understands that nursing agencies and health care agencies have been in operation for many, many decades in the province of Ontario. They are a way to deal with surges and, uh, and challenges that we have when we see a disproportionate rate rise in, in illness or issues. I, I must say, I find it interesting that the member opposite would choose to focus on something that exists in the province of Ontario. You know, we have 800 community <laughs> surgical diagnostic clinics in the province of Ontario, which, by the way, the previous Liberal government approved and, and uh, allowed to operate for many, many years. Why? Because I think they do understand that there is value and there is a place to Response. ensure that people have access in their community in a timely way. We will continue to do that work. Next question, the member for kitchener conestoga Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, my question is for the uh, Solicitor General. And I first want to, uh, to take a minute and thank the courageous and dedicated police officers from the Waterloo Region Police Service. Every day, these men and women put their lives on the line for our community, not only in Waterloo Region, but across the province. So, Minister, just recently, Waterloo Region Police Chief Mark Crowell stated that his officers respond to a minimum of 3,000 mental health calls annually. According to a report by Waterloo Region Police, their officers attend about 9 to 10 mental health calls and 5 to 6 attempted suicides each day. These calls represent complex issues, Mr. Speaker, and our officers need the appropriate tools to support and address them. So through you to the Minister, what is our government doing to help our officers appropriately respond to these types of calls? Good question. The Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank uh, my friend, our member from Kitchener-Conestoga, for his excellent question. Our government has revamped training for police who are now better prepared to identify situations where people are in a mental distress. And I want to highlight and showcase the Ontario Police College in Elmer, Ontario, a place that does extensive training for over 1,500 amazing cadets that will graduate this year to keep Ontario safe. And we're not stopping there. Ontario is currently funding 18 mobile crisis response teams to ensure better outcomes and appropriate responses. And we're investing more than $4 million over two years to keep all of Ontario safe. Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, these are incredible people who protect us every day. The supplementary question. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. And uh, back to the, uh, the Solicitor General, and I want to thank him for the response. And, and we do benefit from one of those teams in Waterloo Region, the IMPACT team, which is phenomenal. We have uh, uh, crisis clinicians embedded with our police officers that are able to actually go out to these calls. Um, but I did want to actually uh, just, just highlight a couple of more things that Chief Crowell has mentioned. Um, and, and he further indicated that um, a, a really a different approach for police officers to respond appropriately to mental health issues is needed. Um, and he stated, and this is Chief Crowell, uh, if we can find any way to offboard the call to alternative responses, 
whether it be a, a non-police response or a follow-up from a mental health professional. And that's the direction that we really want to go. So the chief also stated there's still room for improvement. Um, with the uh, police service aiming for greater alternative service deliveries. So through you again, uh, Mr. Speaker, how is our government supporting our frontline officers in responding to the increasing number of mental health related calls? Solicitor General. Well, Mr. Speaker, and again, thanks to my friend from Kitchener, Conestoga. We continue to take action with funding by our government. The crisis call diversion program in Waterloo went live in November 2022, and Ontario has invested over $9 million over three years for community engagement and well-being branch with the crisis call diversion program. I want to give a shout-out to the great chief there, Chief Crowell. The Crisis Diversion Program engages mental health professionals in the Waterloo Regional Police Communication Centre with the goal of diverting appropriate mental health-related calls away from traditional dispatch police response. Waterloo Regional Police Service is a leader in addressing mental health through the lens of public safety, and we are grateful for their partnership in this issue. Next question, the member for Toronto St. Paul. Thank you, Speaker. Last weekend, City News shared documents obtained via Freedom of Information revealing that the Premier and the Minister of Transportation are directing Metrolinx to withhold information from the public about what has gone wrong with the Eglinton Crosstown P3 project. Little Jamaica and Midtown businesses and residents have endured over 11 years of construction disruption in Toronto St. Paul's. And now this P3 project is delayed yet again, and this government refuses to tell us why. My question is to the Premier. Will the Premier and the Minister of Transportation stop keeping secrets from the public, stop gaslighting my own community, and tell us why the P3 project is once again delayed and when it will finally be completed? Thank you. I'm going to caution the member on her language. And to reply, the Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, Ontarians deserve a transit system that is reliable and safe to use. And right now, our focus is on ensuring that the Eglinton Crosstown is, is safe uh, and at, when it is complete. Uh, Speaker, we've learned from the experience in Ottawa with the Ottawa LRT that you cannot rush a transit system to open before it is ready to do so. The project is currently in one of its most critical phases that will inform with greater certainty exactly when we can say that it will be complete. But, Speaker, progress has been made. We're seeing major intersections along Eglinton open, including Mount Pleasant and Brett Cliff Road. This is good news for businesses, for residents, for commuters. We know this is frustrating. That's why our government Order. has provided funding for businesses Response. that have been affected. But, Mr. Speaker, let me be clear. We are focused on getting it open as soon as it is, as it is safe to do so. Member for Toronto St. Paul's come to order. Supplementary question, the member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Back, back to the minister, actually, because it was the minister that answered the question from Toronto St. Paul's, but I didn't get an answer. The minister said yesterday in this House, Speaker, she was asked why was Metrolinx directed to withhold information from my colleague from Toronto Danforth and my colleague from Toronto Centre about the Ontario line. She told this House in her answer that that was an unacceptable act that she did not condone. But what we just learned from City News is that this has happened again. Information has been withheld from the public about the Eglinton Crosstown LRT at the direction of this minister and at the direction of the Premier. Okay. Speaker, why is this minister demonstrating a pattern in this House of withholding information to the public about transit systems? We need an answer to the question this morning. Great. Minister of Transportation. Well, the pattern of behaviour that Ontarians should be interested in is why this member and the party opposite keep asking about transit delays, when, when this government put, puts forward a piece of legislation that will address transit delays, such as the Building Transit Fast Track, each and every one of them voted against that legislation. You know, they can't have it both ways. Mr. Speaker, I have said since the beginning, I understand the frustration, and we are working very hard. Metrolinx is overseeing the projects to ensure Order. that it opens in a way that is safe. 
for transit riders. That is what Torontonians deserve. And from the member opposite, who knows how Order. important it is not to rush a transit system to open before it is ready. It is ironic that he's asking such a question. I wonder if he's actually read the recommendations and the report that came out of the public inquiry into Response. the Ottawa LRT. Mr. Speaker, Probably not. We're focused on making sure that Torontonians get the transit system they deserve, even though the members opposite keep voting against it. Yeah. Order. Next question, the member for Whitby. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Energy. Ontario has one of the world's cleanest electricity systems, with over 90% of our power generation creating zero emissions. Because of our government's leadership and support, we're fixing the mess in our energy system that the previous Liberal government created. When energy is reliable, affordable, and clean, Speaker, our whole province wins. We've heard from the Minister many times that nuclear power and hydroelectricity are the backbones of our energy system, as they provide low-cost, reliable and emissions-free electricity. Speaker, my constituents want to know what leadership our government is demonstrating in seeking innovative Good energy question. solutions for the future. And to respond, the Minister of Energy. Well, thanks very much, Speaker, and thanks to the member from Whitby for the question. From small modular reactors to battery storage, our government really has embraced innovative and bold energy solutions. And that also includes last week's announcement of a new hydrogen innovation fund. This fund is $15 million that's going to be invested over the next three years to kickstart and develop new opportunities for hydrogen to be integrated into Ontario's clean energy system, including hydrogen electricity storage. This launch marks another milestone in the implementation of our low-carbon hydrogen strategy, positioning Ontario as a clean manufacturing hub for hydrogen. This fund is going to help us lay the groundwork for hydrogen to contribute to our diverse energy supply that we have in the province, Mr. Speaker, and it's going to help us build on the clean energy advantage Response. that we now enjoy in Ontario. The supplementary question. Back uh, to the Minister, Speaker. Uh, what's clear is that our government must support innovative investments in clean technologies like hydrogen that will position Ontario as an energy leader. As we have seen, energy prices and the stability of our energy grid are linked directly to Ontario's economic competitiveness. Now, under the previous Liberal government, surplus electricity generation from Ontario's nuclear and hydroelectric fleets were sold at a loss, Speaker, to competing jurisdictions. Ensuring we have the right energy supply mix is critical to restoring Ontario's economic and competitive edge. Speaker, can the Minister of Energy please elaborate on how our government will ensure we have the right energy supply mix and how this will benefit hard-working families here in Ontario. The Minister of Energy. Speaker, uh, the member is absolutely correct. We inherited a terrible mess when it came to our energy sector in Ontario, and the Hydrogen Innovation Fund that we've now rolled out over the last week or so is going to unlock Ontario's hydrogen economy and support projects across three different streams. Existing facilities that are already built or operational will be used to evaluate how hydrogen can support Ontario's clean grid. We are also going to help build new hydrogen facilities that can grow our capability to use hydrogen. And lastly, the fund will enable research to study new and innovative applications for hydrogen here in Ontario. So by making these investments early, we're paving the way for the growth of our own hydrogen economy in Ontario. We're cleaning up the mess that was left by the previous Liberal government and bringing a stable Ontario energy supply to Ontario. 
It's response. just one more part of our plan to build Ontario's clean energy advantage and to make Ontario a leader in the latest frontier in energy, and that would be the hydrogen economy, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Yeah, yeah. The next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Children and parents are being betrayed by this Conservative government's autism program. A recent news report shared the story of a mother who was moved out of province for better services after being told her child would have to wait until 2027 for a determination of needs assessment. Another mother was forced to take a leave from work simply because she had to sit with her son in school because he is stuck on a wait list with no end in sight. Speaker, it is beyond clear that this government and this minister have failed. What is the minister going to do to overhaul this broken system? Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker. And I, uh, I uh, frankly, I reject the premise of that entire question. Our government is Order. implementing a world-leading program that has been created by the autism community for the autism yep. community. It is a comprehensive needs-based program. We are meeting our benchmarks Order. as we said we would. Uh, all children, as the beginning of this year, have received an invitation, and if anyone hasn't checked their, their email box or answered the phone or received the letter, then they need to do so to make sure that they can get into the program. Order. This is a comprehensive program with mental health, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, speech therapy. This is an ongoing effort to create the supports that vulnerable children and families need, and our government is continuing to do that work. We have been doing that work throughout. The issue is how, unfortunately, there, are, there is information that goes out into Response. the media that is perhaps incorrect. And we need to look into that and find out what is true in that statement. So thank you for bringing it to my attention. The supplementary question. The program that the minister is talking about is sending out invitations, is not giving kids services. You need to fund the programs. You need to ensure there's actual services available with children in them. What does it say about Ontario that if this Conservative government is knowingly depriving children with autism of the supports they need to reach every opportunity for a good life? For five years, this Conservative government has been announcing and re-announcing changes to the Ontario Autism Program, and yet children are falling further and further behind. This minister promised to fund 8,000 kids into core clinical services by fall of 2022, but in October, just 1,511 children had entered into service agreements. That's agreements. That's not actual service. This is 19 per cent of their target. This government has failed to reach Question. their own be benchmark. Can the minister provide families with any guarantee that children will receive services in a timely manner? Yes or no? Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker. That is exactly what we are doing. And again, I reject the premise of your question. The reality is we have five times as many children I'm going to ask the member for Hamilton Mountain to come to order and withdraw. Oh. And withdraw. <laughs> I'll withdraw. The minister can reply. Go for it, Marilyn. The reality is we have five times as many children receiving supports than the previous government before our government came in in 2018. Approximately 40,000 children receiving services and a comprehensive approach. We are meeting our benchmarks. And there are more children than ever before receiving the supports that they need. And we absolutely, we listened. The autism community wanted a new program. We developed a new program that is world-leading, and we are implementing that program. Access OAP is responsible for intake. That is happening. We, that is happening. Member for Hamilton Mountain, that come to order. That is happening. And despite what the member opposite says, I can tell the public with all complete honesty, we are implementing the program by the autism community for the autism community that they asked us to change. Spons. And we're doing exactly that and we'll continue this important work. Thank you.
Next question, the member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Associate Minister of Housing. The Toronto Regional Real Estate Board recently published its uh, 2023 market outlook and 2022 year in review reports. And these reports indicate that high borrowing costs have resulted in a market shift from home ownership to rental demand. Other industry voices, such as the uh, Building Industry and Land Development Association and the Federation of Rental Housing Providers of Ontario, are urging all levels of government to take action regarding policies that will promote purpose-built rental development. We as a government need to take these uh, matters seriously and take action to ensure families and individuals can still access our housing market. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please share what our government is doing to address this market shift? Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I want to thank my honourable colleague for, from Eglinton Lawrence, not only for the question, but for the great work that she does on behalf of her constituents, Mr. Speaker. I actually had the opportunity and the pleasure to speak at the event that the member is referring to, and in my remarks, I emphasized just how important it is for us to continue building on our collective efforts to increase housing supply. Speaker, increasing supply is a big part of the solution to the housing crisis, and our government, under the leadership of Premier Ford, alongside the Municipal Affairs and Housing Minister and the Parliamentary Assistant, uh, Mr. Speaker, will continue to introduce policies that will get more shovels in the ground and for us to build homes faster. And I'm proud to say, Mr. Speaker, that last year we saw the most purpose-built rentals on record with just under 15,000 homes, Mr. Speaker. Let that sink in for a second, Mr. Speaker. We set the record for the most purpose-built rentals ever recorded here in the province of Ontario. So it's clear, Mr. Speaker, our policies are working. And we're hit. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary question. Speaker, thank you to the Associate Minister of Housing for the answer. In, in the same report uh, published by the Toronto Regional Real Estate Board, the market outlook for 2023 emphasizes the need for more rental supply to keep up with rising demands. Rental vacancy rates are projected to fall, and competition between rental households will increase in 2023. Owning or renting a home provides a sense of place and pride in community. It offers individuals and families economic security for decades, even during turbulent times. So with the team we have at Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, as just mentioned by the Associate Minister, I have a lot of confidence that we can build more housing that people will be able to access. But, Speaker, I want, want to ask the Associate Minister once, once again, what other approaches? is our government implementing to address the rental shortage now and for the future? Social Minister. Thank you very much, Speaker. And again, I want to thank my honourable colleague for the question. Speaker, in addition to the record purpose-built rental starts that we had last year, our latest piece of legislation, More Homes Build Faster Act, offers incentives for the construction of more rental units by reducing development fees of 25% on three or more bedroom units, a 20% discount on two bedroom units, and a 15% discount on one bedroom units. Speaker, to further increase rental supply. We also introduced, as of right, policies in, in our most recent bill to allow for more units to be constructed on existing residential lots. Our legislation allows for basement apartments, garden houses, or main residences to have up to three rental units without obtaining additional building permits or pay any additional development fees. Speaker, Ontarians deserve to have Response. affordable options when it comes to housing, and as we've said it before, we're going to continue fighting for every Ontarian to make sure that they do it. Next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Uh, Thank you, Speaker. Question to the Premier. During the Renfrew inquest, the, it, the jury was clear that significant change needs to happen in the way Ontario provides treatment to those who per perpetuate intimate partner violence. But Ontario has not responded to this recommendation. International Women's Day is fast approaching. How many more women will have to suffer preventable violence and death at the hands of perpetuators before Ontario will make meaningful changes in the system that's supposed to protect them? To reply, the Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for the question. Our thoughts continue to be with the victims of the families 
and friends and all those impacted by the tragedy. Everyone has a right to feel safe in their own homes and their own communities, free of intimidation and the threat of violence. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of the Solicitor General has provided an interim response to the Office of the Chief Coroner for Ontario. We will continue working across government to provide updated responses in advance of the anniversary date of the verdict's release, and this will allow time needed to continue to carefully review and consider recommendations, provide a whole-of-government response, and ensure meaningful steps can be identified and taken to address these issues. Mr. Speaker, we are going to get it right. The supplementary question. Yes, thank you very much. Providing a response by actually not answering the question is no response at all. We know that systems and programs can't be perfect unless you fix them. When I was growing up, my dad you'd all, would always say, if you know something is broken, you've got to fix it. Can the government explain how many times it has been warned by the inadequacy of the services that they provide to perpetuators of intimate partner violence, and why won't this government actually fix it today? When will we get a commitment? When will you fix this? Thank you. The Associate Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I think this is a great question, but you know, when I went to the Renfrew County to see the reveal, it was very clear that femicide doesn't just hurt close family, it hurts a whole community. And Mr. Speaker, we are taking action. On February 10th, the government did provide only part one of Ontario's response of the of the chief, Office of the Chief Coroner, and that reflects the, the, the progress that we're making so far. But Mr. Speaker, Across government, we are taking action to make sure women are, are kept safe. We are investing in programs and organizations like some of the many who came here today to see that women are given the freedom and the opportunity to be free and live in their communities, like our investments in Investing in Women's Futures program, like our investments in just so many others. And Mr. Speaker, we take this very seriously. Response. We believe women should be safe. And we did, we did send the um, National Action Plan to the FPT for the Justice of Ministers, uh, uh, for Justice Ministers with a written request that they commit to taking further action to improve the justice system responses. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. I appreciate the opportunity to ask this question of the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. I am so proud that agriculture is one of the largest economic sectors in my riding of Brantford Brant, with ginseng crops being a major product. Our farmers work day in and day out to get Ontario-made products to market that help support our economy. And from the bottom of my heart to all the farmers in my riding, thank you for putting the best quality food on our tables every single day. But, Speaker, over the past few years, our ginseng growers have been hit by significant challenges in their primary overseas markets due to supply disruptions as a result of COVID-19. Our government must show leadership by recognizing, appreciating, and understanding the complexities and uniqueness of ginseng. Speaker, can the minister please share how our government is supporting the sustainable growth of this industry? Thank you. Purveyor Culture, Food and Rural Affairs. Much. And I want to express my appreciation to the member opposite for the amazing advocacy that he shares, not only on behalf of Brant County farmers, but also ginseng growers. And you know, in the fall of 2021, I went into that region of Ontario to visit firsthand ginseng growers to see how the pandemic had impacted the, their markets at a global level. And we were very quick to act. It was our government, under the leadership of Premier Ford and my ministry team, that came together with our ginseng growers to introduce an industry-led pilot program that ultimately led to stabilizing this particular industry. And I'm really pleased to share with you that most recently we participated in a trade mission to both Japan and Vietnam. And it was in Vietnam where we secured three specific ginseng MOUs. We had the Ontario Ginseng Growers Association sign an MOU with the Vietnamese Pharmaceutical Association, and we also had a local Ontario ginseng Response. company sign additional MOUs with business-to-business -business opportunities lying ahead of them. So, Speaker, the bright future lies ahead for not only ginseng growers because they have a government that stands with them and understands agricultural and market issues, 
but they also have a government that believes that it's important to stand with them as we build back our markets around the world. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our question period this morning. The member for St. Catharines has a point of order. Thank you, Speaker. And I, I know this isn't really a point of order today, but um, I would like to wish my number one supporter, my husband, my best friend, and the First Lady of St. Catharines <laughs> a very happy 60th birthday. <laughs> There being no further business at this time, this house stands in recess until 3 p.m. <laughs>